Look at these giants sitting in the desert. These planes used to rule the skies. Boeing, ending production of its iconic 747 jumbo jet. Queen of the skies will soon be the queen of the desert. And for 50 years, if you crossed an ocean, you probably did it in one of these. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. When Boeing 747 first flew in 1969, people couldn't believe something that big could even take off because it seemed physically impossible. Then Airbus built one even bigger than that, which had two full decks and became the largest passenger plane ever built. And airlines couldn't get enough of them, which led to one of the biggest production runs in aviation history. And by the 1990s, multiple 747s took off every hour somewhere in the world which meant the skies were filled with these giants operating around the clock. Boeing delivered 92 747s in 1970, which was their peak production year. So these weren't rare aircraft at all. But look at this now, because Boeing's 747 line shut down in 2023, which means no more are being built. The A380 production ended even earlier, and they built the last one in 2021. But these smaller twin engine planes are a completely different story because manufacturers can't build them fast enough to keep up with demand. I wanted to understand how we went from bigger is better to bigger is dead. So I dug into the numbers and industry reports, and what I found wasn't what I expected at all. Because the story is way more complex than just fuel efficiency or changing technology. Let's go back to the 1960s. If you look at this chaos at Los Angeles airport, you can see it was completely jammed with aircraft. Air travel was exploding during this decade, with passenger numbers growing at 10 to 20% annually, which meant airports were completely overwhelmed by this unprecedented surge in demand. But here's the problem they faced. Because every plane that existed looked like this, with a narrow body, single aisle, and capacity for maybe 150 people maximum. So airlines and airports had a choice to make, which was either build more airports and runways, or build bigger planes that could carry more passengers per flight. Cities like New York, London, and Tokyo had no space for more runways, because you can't just bulldoze Manhattan or tear down neighborhoods to expand airports. Look at it this way to understand the math. Because to move 1,000 people, you need 10 flights with narrow planes. Or you could do it with just two flights if you had something massive enough. So in 1966, Pan Am CEO Juan Tripp walked into Boeing's headquarters and said something that sounded completely crazy at the time. He told them to build him a plane twice as big as anything that exists, which seemed like an impossible request. The 707 carried 150 people, but Tripp wanted 400 people in one plane, which was an unprecedented jump in capacity. Boeing's engineers thought he was insane when they heard this, because nobody knew if something that big could even fly, or if the physics would work out. It would need four engines to get off the ground, and each one would have to be more powerful than anything that existed in commercial aviation. Boeing bet everything on this project, which is why they built the world's largest building just to assemble it, and the factory itself became an engineering marvel. They invested $2 billion in 1966, which translates to $18 billion in today's money when you adjust for inflation. If the 747 failed, Boeing would go bankrupt, which meant the entire company would cease to exist and thousands would lose their jobs. Then, on February 9, 1969, the moment of truth arrived. You can see the concentration on the pilot's face as he prepared to find out if this gamble would pay off. It flew successfully, and that single flight changed everything about how we think about air travel and what's possible in aviation. Look at this interior shot, because you're seeing 400 people in one plane, which was revolutionary for the time. This shows the same number of passengers being moved, but with one quarter of the flights, which completely solved the airport congestion problem. And because you could pack more people per flight, ticket prices dropped 40% over this decade, which democratized air travel. Flying stopped being something only rich people could afford, because it became normal for middle-class families to book trips. Families who'd never flown before were suddenly booking trips to Europe and other continents, which opened up the world in ways that weren't possible before. 
The cost to fly one person one mile dropped by half during this period. And that's the difference between flying once a year versus flying whenever you want for business or pleasure. And airlines realized something important about this platform, which was that if you can make one big plane work, you can make big versions of everything. The 747 took every shape you can imagine over the next few decades, which shows how versatile the basic design really was. There's a freighter version where the entire nose swings open, and you can literally drive cars into it because the cargo bay is so massive. Then there's the short version, designed for ultra-long routes, which could fly New York to Tokyo non-stop without refueling. The stretched version with winglets could carry 600 people, which pushed capacity even further than the original design. The president got one as Air Force One, or actually, he got two for backup and security purposes. NASA even used one to carry the space shuttle across the country, which shows just how strong and adaptable this airframe was. For 30 years, if you crossed an ocean, you probably did it in a 747, because it wasn't just an airplane, but became the symbol of the jet age itself. I remember the first time I saw one up close when I was maybe eight years old, and your brain just doesn't process how big it actually is until you're standing underneath looking up at it. That hump and upper deck exist for an interesting reason, because Boeing put the cockpit up there thinking the 747 would eventually become a freighter, and they wanted the nose to swing open, so they moved the pilots out of the way. They designed it assuming it would be obsolete as a passenger plane within a decade, but they had no idea it would fly passengers for 54 years and become the most iconic plane ever built. Anyway, let's get back to the story. By the 1990s, airlines were printing money with jumbos, and Airbus was watching the success very carefully from Europe. In 2000, Airbus announced the A380, which wasn't just bigger than the 747, but actually double the capacity. Look at this comparison, because a deck and a hump, but the A380 has two full decks that are complete floors from front to back. It could carry 853 people in one plane if you configured it for all economy seating, which is absolutely massive. You could put a shower in it along with a bar and full beds. So it wasn't just transportation, but became more like a flying hotel in the sky. Airbus bet that the future was hubs, which meant giant airports like Dubai and Singapore, where you pack everyone into one city and then spread them out to final destinations. And for a few years, this strategy actually worked quite well because the hub model was growing and the A380 seemed perfect for it. At launch, Airbus received orders from several major airlines, including Emirates and Singapore Airlines, and Emirates alone eventually ordered over 100 of them because they were building Dubai into a massive global mega hub. October 2007 marked the first A380 entering service, and Airbus called it the future of aviation at this huge celebration. And then something unexpected happened that nobody at Airbus saw coming, which would completely change the economics of jumbo jets. Look at this chart right here. Oil prices exploded, and by 2008, oil hit $140 per barrel, which was unprecedented. And when fuel gets expensive, suddenly all the airplane math changes completely, because fuel is an airline's biggest operating cost by far. A 747 burns 12 liters of fuel per passenger per 100 kilometers, which was acceptable when oil was cheap. But a 787 only burns 8 liters for the same distance. And that's 30% less fuel for moving the same person the same distance. Over 20 years of operation, that difference adds up to $50 million in extra fuel per plane, which is a staggering amount. Multiply that by a fleet of 50 jumbos, and you're looking at billions of dollars going up in smoke, which no airline can ignore. But there's something else that changed. Because in the 1980s, if you had a twin-engine plane, regulators said you couldn't fly over the ocean at all. Twins had to stay within 60 minutes of an airport at all times, which meant hugging coastlines and no direct ocean crossings. The rule was simple and made sense. Because if one engine fails, you need backups. So you needed three or four engines for safety. But in 1985, everything changed with ETOPS. If your engines were reliable enough, twins could now cross oceans directly, which opened up entirely new route possibilities. 
And the 777 proved it could be done safely with 99.97% reliability, which convinced regulators this was safe. Suddenly, you didn't need four engines anymore because the regulations that made jumbos essential just disappeared overnight. And remember Airbus's bet that everyone would fly through massive hubs? Airlines started doing this instead, which is called point-to-point -point flying. Instead of packing 400 people into one London flight per day, airlines flew 250 people to London, Manchester, and Edinburgh with three flights per day to each city. Passengers loved this new approach because it meant no connections, no layovers, and no three-hour waits in Dubai or other hubs. And airlines responded by ordering twins by the hundreds. And the 787 alone has over 1,400 orders on the books. But jumbo orders collapsed during the same period, which tells you everything about where the market was heading. So why did the jumbos die? Here's the thing you need to understand. Because it's not just one reason, but everything happening at once. Four engines cost way more than two engines to operate because maintenance alone is double, and each engine overhaul costs millions and takes weeks. ETOPS changed the regulatory landscape, which meant twins could suddenly do what only jumbos could do before, in terms of ocean crossing. Fuel prices spiked during the 2000s and never came back down to those cheap 1990s levels. Airlines completely changed their network strategies because they shifted to more routes with smaller planes and higher frequency instead of the hub model. December 2021 marked when the last A380 rolled out, and you can see factory workers standing around the final plane. 14 years of production came to an end, which was much shorter than anyone expected when the program launched. The 747 lasted longer, at 54 years total, but it wasn't profitable anymore either toward the end. Boeing launched the 747-8 in 2011 with new engines, better fuel efficiency, and modern everything. Airlines bought 47 passenger versions total, which is a tiny number compared to the thousands of 787s they ordered. January 31st, 2023 became the day the last 747 ever built rolled out of the Everett factory. You can see the workers saying goodbye to this plane that defined their careers and shaped aviation history. And now they're sitting here in places like Victorville, Mojave, and Pinal Air Park in the Arizona desert. Some will fly again for cargo or special charters, but most won't ever leave this desert.